Uh, I've been coming to Dublin for 25 years. It's a pretty amazing place, still, despite the rain. Um, I currently live in Switzerland. It, you know, it's really interesting. I, I lived in the US for 17 years. I was born in Germany, and now I live in Switzerland. So if I speak like everything is awesome, that's my American speaking. Uh, if I speak about perfection, that's my German background. If I say nothing, that's my Swiss background. Yeah, just kidding. So I want to talk to you about the future of content and media. First of all, let's think about this for a second, right? What makes content and media really powerful? Right? The future of content and media, in my view, is not technology. It's humanity. What kind of content touches us as people has little to do with how we generate it. It has all to do with who we are and what the context is. Technology, of course, is changing everything to do with media. But let's not make the mistake and say, well, just because it is mobile, you know, of course, you know that in five years, everything is mobile, including our brain. I mean, your brain is already mobile. Just look around you. I mean, the mobile phone is essentially a brain extension. Right? What we do on the mobile is backing up our brain, outsourcing our memory, picking our partners, doing all the things that we used to do with our own heads. Now, you can argue that's sometimes a good thing, sometimes a bad thing. But really, what happens here in our future is something very interesting. And so I want to talk about quickly what I do as a futurist. And uh, some of the, what I do as a futurist, which is a pretty common word in the Anglosphere, uh, in uh, mainland Europe, most people don't know what a futurist is. You know, they think it's either a madman or some sort of uh, uh, cocktail of surprises. But I look at a five-year time frame, so I'm not like Ray Kurzweil or Alvin Toffler, unfortunately. I would make more money that way. But uh, I surprise people with interesting things. I look at things sometimes that are painful. If you watch House of Cards, you know what, exactly what that quote is from. Sometimes I have to put fear into people because that's how they change in the future. And sometimes, of course, I go for excitement. So basically, the most important thing I can tell you right off the bat is that we're looking at an exponential future. Now, this is a really strange thing for people to understand because as humans, we are not exponential. We don't have even the, the remote potential to be exponential. Right? We're linear. We're wetware. Right? We're, we can't scale with technology. Not yet. I'm not, I'm not sure we would want that. But everything around us is becoming digital, is being automated, is being disintermediated. Automation, for example, and content is all over us. I mean, there's companies like Narrative Science that write articles, literally like write articles. Pretty soon, the first TED talk will be held with a robot giving a talk. Of course, that would be pretty easy, just say awesome and change the world for the common good a lot, and then it would be fine. But the challenge of exponential change is amazing. There's huge opportunities here because now, if you look at this curve, we're at the takeoff point. The stuff we talked about in the 90s, in the first wave of the internet, is finally actually happening. I remember the paperless office, right? Oh, yes, paperless office. It's actually happening now. Flying cars, happening now. Right? Self-driving cars, to some degree, happening now. Look at this slide. How long will it take for computers to have the same power as the human brain? Same thing, right? What Hemingway referred to gradually then suddenly. Not much happens for a long time, and we don't think it's real. But then we have this, right? The last few period is just boom, and we're there. And that is exponential. So think about your future as a content creator or as a publisher or as a media company is going to be exponentially different. And the good news is this. I've been in the media business doing media stuff since 1995. I used to be a musician and producer. Thankfully, that was before the internet, so you can't find any of it. Um, but in any case, technology came along and disrupted everything. Music, films, television, publishing, financial, Bitcoin, you know, the story goes on. But now in media, we're coming out of the valley of death. The valley of death is the valley where we couldn't figure out the old system is dead, the new one isn't here yet. And we're coming out of that now. There's a lot of reasons for that, but the primary reason is mobile. 
Because finally, there is a mechanism to get, to produce, and now, very soon, to pay. And also, the mobile is personal. We're not going to ac accept the garbage and the junk from television advertising on our mobile screen. <laughs> We're going to have to be better than that. So what happens here is clearly you know, mind-boggling changes. Uh, Deloitte predicts a $62 billion market for on-demand content. I mean, remember all the stories last year or a couple of years ago about how people just are not, not willing to pay for content, right? Don't believe it. They will pay, but it has to be absolutely irresistible. If Spotify would cost a pound a week, or better yet, two pounds a month, would there be a single person who wouldn't have a service like this? Because then you could find all kinds of ways of paying for it. And think about that for a second. If the New York Times wasn't $350 a year, how many subscribers would they have? $20 a year? 40 million subscribers? Netflix is a sex story here, right? This is the number one story. I think there aren't that actually that many people in Ireland who are subscribing. Only like 200K, I think. Something like that. But internationally speaking, if the studios would give a license to Netflix anywhere, these guys would have three, four hundred, five hundred million subscribers. Talk about a willingness to buy for, for value. So what's very important, what Richard said earlier, right, we're going from broadcasting to what I call broadbanding. Of course, it's a, a so-called neologism. I made up this word, but broadbanding essentially means that what we're doing now is we're connecting to each other. We're not just using a central place. Broadcasting isn't going away. It's merging with broadbanding. This is the biggest opportunity for all the big TV organizations, private and public, around the world, right? We're going from broadcasting to connecting. A great quote from the new chief digital officer of the White House. Wow, what a title, huh? Wouldn't you like to have that chief digital officer, right? He says, basically, journalism is moving from a broadcasting model to a connecting model. And this is the success of social media, of course, in parentheses, success, right? But he says, connecting involves an invitation to participate in something. And that is a killing proposition of broadbanding, that we can do that. Of course, not all the times, all time you want to be connecting and giving feedback and participating. That's broadcasting, right? It's still going to be there the one way that you're going to need. But in this world, we're talking about connectivity, we're talking about as a creator, is to create a ripple effect, right? to, to, make, to create meaning, not to create noise. I mean, a couple of years ago, it was enough to create noise on the web to be there. Right? Now you have to actually say something interesting. In most Western countries, we're much more concerned with meaning, with, with context, with sense-making, than we are with it being free or cheap. Right? I mean, this is the future of you know, how we're going to uh, proceed in this direction. Because now technology is also rapidly changing our perception of reality. Do you know that there's like uh, 50 companies looking to out augment our vision? Not Google Glass, which is kind of on hold for the time being, right? but the Microsoft HoloLens, augmented reality, the Oculus Rift, this is going to be the new mobile phone. In fact, talk about external brains, right? That is a scary thought. As a professor, in 10 years, there will be very few left who are not going to wear a thing like this. And in some ways, it may be actually invisible. So technology is changing our perception, how we do it. And of course, all the interfaces are changing. Talking to your computer, right? Star Trek, hats here now, I do that now. My wife thinks I'm off my rocker, you know, when I talk to my computer, giving it commands and looking for stuff, right? I actually dictate my emails now. And, you know, in a, in a few years, it'll be easily possible to sit on your couch and say, hey, give me the uh, scene from Colombo, 1974, where he drives over his dog or something, right? And boom, it will play. Right? Mind-boggling those changes. What we're going to see here clearly is an interesting challenge. And here on the left, you see my current screensaver on my iPhone. And, and why do I have this? Because, you know, this is so powerful. It's magnetic. It's addictive. You can't get enough. And the endorphins released to you when somebody likes what you do 
right? It's like a drug. Uh, you can get this if you look for a screensaver on Mashable. There was a big report about this being a popular screensaver, right? And the other one I have you like even more, right? Don't take a picture. <laughs> I figured you would take pictures, so I put this in, right? <laughs> and this is the other thing about technology, right? We're always talking about technology making us more open and connected and stuff. Really what it comes down to is we have to be able to digest, to immerse, right? to be human. It is not human to constantly intake. That's not about, that's basically a, a hyperdrive mode, right? I mean, basically, machine thinking. That's not going to be our future. If you want to do that, then become a robot, right? Take vitamin pills or whatever. Blow yourself up with information. Feel like a Superman with a mobile. Right? It's interesting, you know, this is really, a, there's a great word for this called hellven, hell and heaven, right? I use a hashtag, hellven, for this. It could be heaven, it could be hell, depending on which side you look at it. But clearly, looking to the right side here, right, is this going to be human in the future, to constantly receive and send? Right? That is, in my view, not really human. The future of content is going to be about this, right? Meaningfulness, sense-making, contextual, immersive, emotional, all the stuff that machines can do at least for the next, you know, two years. No, just kidding. Uh, 200 years. Right? That is the future of what we do as creators. Automation is going to force us, as this guy said in his book, David Pink, uh, actually not David, Daniel Pink, any job that depends on routines is going to be automated away. Many of your jobs, if they depend on routines, will be automated by software. The only way out is not to be software, not to be the machine, right? The future belongs to a very different kind, creators, empathizers, pattern recognizers, meaning makers. In fact, I would argue to you, refuse to be technology. Use technology, but don't become technology. I mean, this is an interesting angle, right? You know, the providers of that technology, all the big internet, what's called, been referred to as big content, and big data companies, they want us to become technology. Because it's a lot easier if we also became technology. Huh? But that's not our path in the future. The path in the future is going to be about what Kevin Kelly calls visuality with a Z for some reason. But you know, I'll just cut and paste from him. But uh, forgive me for that, but it's all about visuality. If you look at what's happening, how many people are willing to pay for content, right? The top, this is international uh, uh, research here showing the top is visual media. Visual media is the future, it's going to be about 80% of what we have online. And we're the takeoff point. And interesting to see the money will always follow the eyeballs. If you're interested in money, you know, for those that are, just a tiny minority of you, I'm sure, uh, to follow the eyeballs. If we look at this, you know, looking at the graphs here, I mean, we can clearly see what's happening here. You know, how many people are you're watching video and what's happening with throughput and all that stuff, the money follows the eyeballs. And just a few days ago, Facebook announced that you can, in the future, pay each other through Facebook. That is the moment where you can have subscribers. That is the moment where people can say, you know what, I like your contributions, I like your videos, I like your posts, I like your opinions, I'll put some money into the pot with one click. And that's not, not just going to be Facebook, that's going to be possible everywhere. So that's actually one of the solutions we're going to see in the future. And then we have this convergence. You know, we used to think about these industries as being separate. Well, they're not, actually. Right? They're all converging in one platform, and that's mobile. On the mobile, you can take care of your health records and transmit them. You can do payments. You can watch content. You can broadcast. You can publish. You can do your banking. You can get divorced on the mobile as well. There's uh, 30 apps for that, if you're so inclined. And then we have this. A rabbit, no, just not, not the rabbit. Abundance. Right? We have too much of everything. There's a great book by Peter Diamantis, which a lot of things that he says, I, I find strictly a Silicon Valley, a California ideology, but he talks about abundance. The book is called Abundance. And so everything that happens around us is becoming abundant. A graph from Peter saying that 
going with the singularity kind of idea, right? In 20 years, we'll have abundance. We have abundance of music today, 60 million songs on Spotify, uh, Netflix, Kindle. Right? Everything is becoming abundant. And guess what? In the future, energy will be abundant. We're going to solve that problem. Abundance will be a global trend, and then we're going to have to say, well, basically, we have abundance outside, you know, in terms of distribution and choices, but scarcity is inside. You know, inside meaning meaning, context, whatever, happiness. Right? The purpose of life is not to accumulate more abundance, right? but to find happiness in some way. And that's what you do as a content owner, right? to create that feeling of connectivity. So basically what's happening here is it forces us to shift our emphasis towards real, true, and in-context experiences. And that's our future as creators. Real, true, in-context experience. Even if they are in virtual reality, they can still be real and true, right, to some degree at least. <laughs> now a word of warning about people who are thinking about this, right? This so-called big data movement, right? Using data to make everything completely transparent. Data journalism. I think this is a good thing, right? Let's not get this wrong. It is a good thing. But ignorance is dangerous, but so is desiring omniscience. This is not going to be happening, right? If, if this was possible, we'd be in deep trouble, right? We would live on Space Odyssey and talk to hell if that was the case. So let's look at data, but let's not necessarily require omniscience. In this, uh, in this book, A Whole New Mind, from 10 years ago, right, he says abundance in an age of abundance appearing only to rational, logical, and functional needs is insufficient. And this was 10 years ago. It's so much more true even today. Mobile meaning mastery, and I had to look for something with an M, so I pick mensch. I, I hope you know what that means. I'm not Yiddish or uh, Jewish, but still it's a good word, right? So that is our direction, meaning, mastery, not superficiality. And this pyramid here from IBM shows where things are going. In this DIKW pyramid, we're going from data to wisdom, to intelligence. We're not going towards a pyramid to where we're going to be providing data and information only. Right? It's going to be about wisdom intelligence, all these things. Well, what I call humor rhythms. Sorry, was too quick on this one. I have to come towards the end here, but I will give you a couple more scenes to take home. P point number one, in this world where a computer performance is beating human performance, and where we are at this point of takeoff right, in technology, we're going to have to think about what that means. I think great stories will always be made with what I call humor rhythms not algorithms. We will all use algorithms and technology, but the future of what we do is about humor rhythms. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a yes or no, it's a continuum of technology and humanity. It's about finding jobs that are above the API. And there's a great article about this in Forbes magazine. You know, if you have a job that's below the API, that means some sort of software is going to pull in information that you used to do, you're dead in a couple years. Your job has to be above the API. It has to be in a place where the machine can say, not compete with you. And that's going to be our future. Machines are for answers. Humans are for questions. That is the really important thing about what we do, is to ask questions. I mean, this, this is what makes us human, is to be able to do that. The left brain, right? The task of the left brain will be increasingly done by machines. Computing, mathematics, facts, logic. And we're moving towards the right brain. Of course, in the end, it's, you know, it's really kind of both. You know, the, the theory of left and right brain to be completely different is an old theory, of course. Right? They do actually interact and belong together. But our skills in the future, moving in this direction, right? moving into a direction that allows us to do this. I'll skip this quickly, just a quick word on this. Uh, how uh, Facebook is uh, changing journalism. I think we have to be extremely careful about what I call the secondary purpose. Right? Facebook wants to actually bring content into Facebook, and 
I think it's questionable to, to ask if we want to give content to companies that have a secondary purpose in life, which is to monetize and to get data. Right? Journalism isn't their reason. I have to wrap up, so I'll give you a brief summary of three important things. Expect exponential changes and opportunities. Move above the API, above the line of where algorithms can do your job. Quiet the left brain. Don't quit it, quiet it. Broadcasting, broadbanding, connecting, and humorance, and abundance outside, scarcity inside. I'll leave you with the last quote from Alan Kay, the best way to predict the future is to create it. Thanks very much for listening.